All right, let's begin. Let me say hello to everybody and welcome you. I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's cat herder, creator, and host. And also today, unusually, I get to be our guest. Uh, so let me just ask very quickly, uh, for those of you who uh, have access to the chat room, if you could just quickly in the chat say hello and where you're coming in from today. Uh, for example, I'm coming to you from Manassas, Virginia. And while you do that, uh, I'll introduce the program and then get to the fun. So this is the Future Trends Forum. I think I recognize everybody here. I think every one of you has been to this before. Um, but for those who haven't been for a while, let me give you a little bit of background. And for those who are going to be listening to this on the YouTube recording, um, let me just give you a little bit of an introduction. So first of all, uh, the forum is a conversation-based program. Uh, this is all about discussions about the future of higher education. Typically, we have some great guest, and we get to discuss with them uh, their vision of where higher education could be going. Uh, we often do this in the company of dozens of people, if not hundreds, like yourselves, who get to ask questions and to share thoughts. Now, the forum is part of a whole series of projects called the Future of Education Observatory, and that includes the forum. It also includes the monthly FTTE report. It includes a blog, a book club, and more than that. So if you're new to it, just go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Uh, just a quick question, too. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, just let me know in the chat if, um, if my audio is okay. Now, if nobody's saying anything, um, maybe the chat, maybe the audio isn't that good. Okay. Well, it sounds like it's still going. Um, let me thank some of our sponsors and then dive into today's unusual session. So first of all, I want to thank NizerNet from New York State. This is a nonprofit that helps that state's colleges and universities get online with broadband internet and do great things with each other. Um, we are really proud of the work they do and delighted that they can help sponsor us. We're also really grateful to Shindig, because as you all know, Shindig makes available this technology that we're using now. So today, I have to say that uh, we are going to be using this in a few ways. Um, one is, I'm going to be showing you some stuff visually, so you'll get a chance to see them. Um, but also, you'll get a chance to uh, ask me questions about this crazy book. Um, and I would love to bring as many of you up on stage as possible. Um, now, the stage is where I am. This is where this um, uh, slide is, just for a moment. We could have several of us up here to discuss. Um, in order to ask your questions and raise your comments, you can just um, use either on the two major buttons on the bottom of the screen. There's a white strip running along it. You'll see second from left and third from left are buttons with a question mark and a raised hand. If you click the raised hand, that tells me that you want to join us up here on stage. And in fact, just to make it even easier, there's a little teal colored box up here right now. And if you press that, they should bring you up on stage right away. And if you don't want to do that, or if you can't, just use the question mark to type in a question, com question comment, as Tom Tobin already did. And thank you, Tom. Much appreciated. Um, if you also want to tweet about this, just use the hashtag FTTE, and you can use that to keep the conversation going intertwined with that social media platform. We're really grateful to Shingbit for making this technology available. And I'm also especially delighted and grateful to our supporters on Patreon. Uh, there's about 100 people there who contribute as little as a dollar a month to keep the lights on. And you can see here from this slide people who give $10 a month. We really appreciate that. We can't do it without you. And if you'd like to join them, just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. Now, I mentioned before that a typical session involves a brilliant guest, um, hundreds if not or dozens of you, and a conversation. Well, today is a little different. Instead of a brilliant guest, you have me. Uh, and the reason is because I have just published a new book. And I wanted to use this time to share the book with you all. Um, to get your thoughts and to also thank you for your help in making it possible. 
so the book is called Academia Next. Uh, it just appeared from the awesome Johns Hopkins University Press. And if you'd like to look at a copy online or order a copy, below me, uh, on the left edge of the screen, there should be two buttons, one for the official press and one for an Amazon link. Pressing either of those will pop up a page so that you can poke around. And uh, if you want, order a copy or two. We'd be delighted to hear that. Um, so let me just move this out of the way. Uh, and say just what I'd like to do uh, for the next half hour. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the book so you can get a sense of what it does, where it came from. And I'd also like to have some fun. So by fun, I mean I have two different copies of the book right here, which I can give away to the first people who would like to have them. In fact, I will try to randomize that um, so I can pick them out. And for those of you who are looking at clothing, we have the first two ever Academia Next t-shirts ready to go. Uh, Stephen, if you'd like to join us, you might want to point your camera at your fair face. Uh, because right now, I can't see it. I can see your desktop and some wires, I think. Really? Yeah, either that or you had some drastic facial surgery. Hmm. <laughs> Well, while Stephen's doing that, um, let me just uh, celebrate a little formally with a little bit of bubbly, which I will unleash upon my office. How can that be? Well, Stephen, if you don't want, do you want to just uh, do you want to just refresh the screen and um, and try that to see if that'll help? <laughs> I know. So you still can't see it. Nope. No, no luck so far. Um, okay. We'll try that again. Now, while I pry this loose, let me just tell you a little bit about the book, uh, give you an introduction to it, um, and explain what it's about. And then I would love to hear your questions and thoughts. Um, if you'd like, I'd be happy to summarize key parts. Um, if you want, I could read key parts if you like, but I'd rather talk about it and hear it from you. Um, so the whole idea of the book is to give us a sense of where higher education is headed over the next roughly 15 years. Now the focus is on the United States in part, hang on a second. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I think this is the first ever live toast that we've done on the Future Trends Forum. Cheers to you all. Ah, Stephen, there you are. And your sound is gone. Oh, I don't see you muted on this side. Now, it looks like you've got good output, uh, good signal strength. No, I still can't hear you at all. Okay. So if any of you in the audience uh, right now have um, any uh, drinks of your own or any treats, please indulge and join me. Um, I would like to thank you all and propose a toast to you all for helping um, make this book possible. Uh, almost every one of you has contributed your thoughts, your comments, your feedback, and your good wishes. And to all of you, I thank you. Books like this are impossible without friends like you. So to begin, the idea of the book um, it took form about 10 years ago as I started my uh, full-time research in the future of education and technology. And I wanted to give a deep dive into where all this could be headed. And one of the problems I ran into was that the field was so large, there were so many moving parts that it was impossible to do briefly. So I began with the Future Trends in Technology and Education Report, FTTE, and documenting these through Horizon Scan, going back right now about 10 years. Um, and that's the first part of Academia Next. The first five chapters are a detailed, detailed look at all these trends reshaping higher education. 
uh, everything from demographics and economics to individual technologies to educational technologies, enrollment, policy, changes in how higher education is financed. And it looks through all those in great detail. The idea there is to try to find as much concrete evidence from the present, as many signals of the future embedded in the, embodied in the present day as we could. Okay, Stephen, try to talk now. I am trying to talk now. Hey, success. And I can successfully hear you. I just set up a brand new computer today, so some of the regular stuff wasn't working by default. I'm not seeing you at the moment, but that's a separate issue entirely. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, I hear you perfectly. Okay. Um, and everybody else, um, uh, can you let me know if you can see me? Um, in fact, uh, tell you what. Um, let's see. Um, Stephen, just to make sure so we can be on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> let me just try one thing. Hold it right there for a sec. Yep. Okay, am I both visual and audio? Ah, there you are. Very good. Hey, now we're both on the same page. Exactly, and quite literally. Well, welcome. <laughs> um, and thanks for coming. You were a great guest before, and you're a great participant um, uh, in these programs. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's always my pleasure. I have utterly no idea what to say, but it's always my pleasure. <laughs> well, you have so much to say. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think, I think everybody here knows uh, your splendid OL Daily, uh, which is just one of the essential resources for anybody thinking about education technology, or education in general. So I got a question. I have a burning question. I always have this question, <laughs> but I rarely get the chance to actually put it to the relevant person in question. Why a book? Why a dead tree version of your words that I can't link to in my newsletter? Well, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, a few reasons. Uh, one is that um, for every person like you or I um, who wants to have the digital version to, you know, to remix, to link to, to uh, highlight, and so on, uh, there are other people in this potential audience who prefer uh, the dead tree format. Um, let me just say a word about that. By audience, the intended audience is basically everybody involved in higher education. So students, faculty, librarians, administrators, as well as people directly adjacent to that. Uh, so for example, state government leaders, um, trustees, people in companies, foundations, nonprofits who are interested in higher education or adjacent to it. Um, and believe me, you know me, Stephen, I produce lots, lots of digital content, like what we're doing right now. Yeah. But I also, it's a kind of bifocal approach. Um, I also have to address the people who uh, would prefer to get this. So that's one reason. Uh, the second is that um, uh, this had to be long. It had to be book length because there is so much work in it. And we can make digital content of that length. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, many, many people really prefer to snack uh, digitally. And it's, it's hard to find some real long text. Uh, just, just so you know, I don't know if other people are having this experience, but you're sounding like you're underwater right now. Um, let me know from chat, people, if um, if so. I can actually switch to a different uh, room, just about ten feet over here, uh, if that's a problem. Yeah. Um, Sounds regular to everybody else, so must be just my, my bandwidth. <laughs> or, or it's Canada that uh, Justin Trudeau has done something, you know. Yeah, no, it's the um, <laughs> um, But uh, no, oh. to be fair, this is available in digital form. Um, it, there is, this is available in ebook form. Um, so uh, Johns Hopkins is very good about having both of those. Um, well, I saw that. Um, and that leads me to my second question. Mm -hmm. Your ebook costs the same as the regular book. So, like, how does that happen? Uh, you'd have to talk to the publisher about that. The, <laughs> the pricing is something that I have uh, no control over. I mean, I can speak generally to ebook pricing um, and the different models of it. But yeah. um, now, in fact, the uh, editor for Johns Hopkins was here. He's in the airport heading to a, uh, a flight. Um, so this is the awesome and wonderful editor, Greg Britton. If you want to text chat him, 
uh, and say hi to him and ask him about that. Um, but other than that, seriously, I, I would just ask the press why. Um, one one more thing, if I could if I could say it, um, both you and I, Stephen, based on visual evidence, uh, love books. Um, <laughs> I guess I. <laughs> It, it seems like an odd sort of line of questioning given my backdrop. Yeah. It, it, it's literally your backdrop. And uh, yeah. and I love writing books. This is my third. It's a fourth if you, can, if you count the second edition of my first. And um, it's a lifelong dream to, to write books. So. Yeah, I love books. Uh, although, to be honest, I haven't read a paper book in a number of years now. And uh, although, you know, I still haul them off the shelf. This is the most recent. Some things never go away, right? How is it? This uh, Rushkoff, Siberia. Oh, no, I said, how is it? Oh, it's, it's a great book. I read it when it came out like 20 years ago. Okay. And uh, the pages are yellowed now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was a great book, influential on me. Uh, I guess that's the sort of effect you're intending to have with your book. Like, uh, the whole idea of, uh, you know, content, using content online as surfing uh, and all of that, um, that came from that book for me anyways. Uh, you know, so, and, and just the idea of responding to uh, chaotic and unpredictable phenomena the way a surfer would, where you don't memorize everything ahead of time. You just give it an environment and you do the wave. Uh, I love video and stuff. Uh, that was in Siberia. Um, really? So I've carried that with me ever since. So that's a plug for someone else's book during your book launch. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. I, I appreciate this. And uh, um, I've been trying to get Doug to be a guest on the program. So, um, after grilling you a bit, perhaps hypocritically, um, let me let me ask a, a more softball question. Uh, what would be the one thing that I should take from your book? You in particular, or the audience in general? Uh, let's say the audience in general, because I'll be you know I'll find something really weird on page one ninety seven. Every every reader is different. Yeah. And uh, a key thing to take away is that it's really important to think about higher education from a future-oriented perspective. And that is to think about the future being different than the past in certain ways and to be really open to all those possibilities. And that's actually surprisingly hard to do. Uh, a great deal of discussion about future of education is really grounded in more of the same. And, uh, and when people say same, they often mean mm -hmm. 95 or so. Um, so that's one thing I want to take. So, okay, let me press a bit on that. What, if it's not the same, what is it? Well, there are a lot of differences. And one of the things I do, and you can see this in the subtitle of the book, is the futures, plural, of higher education, um, is to look at a, a series of different possibilities for where it can unfold. Um, and again, the focus for this volume is largely on the United States uh, because A, it's a huge, huge field. Uh, B, it's globally significant. Um, and C, I had to keep this down to one book right now. <laughs> uh, and I'm quite serious about doing a future of higher education project. That's just um, um, something that's a lot larger to do. Um, but uh, one thing is to think about the size and shape of higher education. That is, we may have overbuilt um, the number of institutions so that we will have to reduce them, uh, either through closures or mergers or some other form of transformation. Uh, it may also include changing the number of students. Uh, the number of students enrolled in U.S. higher education has gone down uh, the past eight years. So it's possible that we're just shrinking. Uh, I, I have a scenario for this called peak higher education. It may be that we're on the downhill side of, of peak. Um, the second is to think about what happens when the majority of students uh, are taking classes online. However, however we measure that. I mean, if, if it's the majority taking all classes online or a mix, um, that's an interesting milestone to think about uh, when face-to-face -face becomes um, on a par with online or becomes secondary. Uh, mm -hmm. Another way to think about this, or it makes me optimistic, um, is to uh, think about this in terms of more international higher education. Uh, except for two countries in the world, uh, 
um, higher education is more international. I, I don't mean that in a vague general sense of globalism. I mean that we have on the on the student side, we have more and more movement across international borders. Yeah. You think about the European higher education area, which is a tremendous, tremendous way of, of uh, enabling motion. We also have on the research side, more and more international collaboration, especially in the sciences. And uh, we're also seeing lots and lots of countries and regions building up, bulking up their higher ed capacity, most notably China. Um, and I, I think this is amazing. And I said, but for two countries, uh, the United Kingdom and the US have backed away from this over the past uh, two or three years. Um, most other countries aren't quite following this, possibly Hungary, although uh, their influence is pretty small because they're a much more a smaller nation. Um, but it's possible that we will see um, just a, a much more transnational form of higher education. Uh, for example, when you think about MOOCs, set aside everything about MOOCs for one second. Usually, no nation in, from what I saw the first few years of MOOCs, usually no one nation dominated the student body. So think about this. If, if you're taking classes online, and that, you know, you are in a national minority, uh, this is not surprising for small nations, but it can be shocking to a country like the United States. Yeah. Think about you might think about the physical campus where there's no national plurality or no national uh, majority. What a fascinating thing that could be. So that's a, another difference uh, to bear in mind. Um, I, I, in the last part of the book, uh, or let me back up a little bit, Stephen, to answer this. Um, and the first part of the book looks at trends. And so the first book is very, very present oriented. The first part of the book looks at the present and establishes this battery of trends. The second part of the book then extends those to the future, uh, partly by extrapolation and partly by generating scenarios. Now, if you're if you're new to scenarios, friends, a scenario is a story about the future where one or two trends powerfully reshape what you're talking about. And each of the trends is based on each of those scenarios rather is based on something that's quite possible. Uh, the most dramatic one. One which I call the augmented campus, where we have a mix of virtual reality and augmented reality that reshapes what a physical campus looks like. And that may be um, too extreme for the next five years. I don't think so. I think technically it's quite feasible. But that gives you a very different shape of campus. So I, those are a few, a few ways. To, does that give you a start for your answer? Yeah, that's a start. Uh, I've always, I mean, I, I read lots of this futurist stuff, and of course I've seen, I love your wine model, your wine glass. <laughs> uh, and I've always considered the scenarios approach to be a bit of a cop-out. You know, like you're looking at the future and you don't just give us one future, you give us four. Uh, or I assume it's four, because it's usually four. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, there are actually um, seven scenarios Oh, um, plus a chapter of extrapolations, plus a chapter looking um, beyond 2035. So that's, you're really failing to predict the future then, there's seven different possibilities. Um, so what, what, what are we supposed to do with that for seven different futures? How do you plan for that? Um, one of the things you do, there are a lot of things you do. Um, one of them is the simple first order effect that I hope is, like I said before, getting people to imagine the future. This is like, in, it's like the experience of reading science fiction. You know, it opens your imaginative faculty. And that's one key thing that I hope to see. The second is that the process of all this, again, when I have all these trends, is to get campuses as well as libraries and museums and governments to start doing their own futures work. I want them mm -hmm. to think about this, to do their own horizon scan, their own trends analysis, and say, what's shaping that future for them. And then that opens them up to strategic planning. So they can start thinking about what kind of student they should anticipate in 10 years or how publishing will change. And again, this this is plural because I, I don't believe in predicting a single unitary future. I think that's a that's a doomed game. Um, this is really a cognitive act. <laughs> there are a few other people who want to join us. Let me bring them up on, on stage here. Um, and in fact, there we go. You can kick me off if you want. I've, I've harangued you enough. I, I will at some point. I will. Right. But, but let me welcome Phil Katz. Hello, Phil. Hi, Brian. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Can you hear me? Perfectly. You sound very good. Thank Great. you. Uh, I'd like to, to take you from um, scenarios and ask you a little bit about analogies. 
and um, I'm maybe you talk about it in in the book. But a lot of the discussions about the future of the academy um, try to analogize to other industries, whether it's um, information industries like newspapers and publishing, or other sort of intrinsically high labor organizations like um, orchestras that have some of the same labor. Uh, same, some of the same Bomal's disease that higher education or disrupted industries like cabs and Uber. So which of any of those analogies or others do you find even remotely useful to be thinking about what's happening uh, with academia next? That's a terrific question. And by the way, uh, Phil was a great guest uh, talking about the Council of Independent Colleges, um, a wonderful intercampus humanities teaching program. And the CIC is a great group, which has tremendous work. Um, a little extra in your tech this week. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, the uh, I, I resisted a lot of analogies because uh, they really seem to break down pretty quickly. The newspaper analogy, for example. Um, I did come up with one, and uh, when I realized this analogy, I almost gave up the entire project. Uh, to get the <laughs> um, and that analogy was to healthcare, um, and, uh, and specifically, specifically to American healthcare. Um, so in general, there's a similarity with healthcare in that we're talking about providing public care, uh, very human intensive, um, you know, all kinds of interesting issues of gender and professionalization. Uh, definitely Bomal's cough disease. So by the way, I'm sorry, if, we, if you haven't heard the term, Bomal's cough disease was created by two economists, Bomal and Bowen. Um, and the idea is that there's some fields of economics where you cannot uh, speed up and uh, without ruining what you're doing. Um, so you think about fast food, does provide food, whatever you think. Uh, you think about factory, which are able to produce more content, but brain surgery, you don't want to speed up because it would be bad for you. String quartet is often used as an example. In higher education, we have yet to find a way uh, that could actually speed up like that. So just we can talk more about that if you like. That's that's more for most diseases. Um, but, uh, but healthcare suffers from that as well. Um, what made me so depressed was that both in, in the US, the financial structure uh, for both higher education and uh, and healthcare have a lot in common. Um, they're both very very opaque. Uh, you know, if you if you head into an emergency room, uh, you're not the price. Um, and if you go to have a surgery done, you're not sure of what you're going to pay until after the insurance is done with it. And even if it is done with it, you can still do more. Um, higher education is similarly opaque. We don't have students don't have insurance, but there's the whole question of discounting, uh, which is very very tricky. Uh, our prices change. Um, and then there's also the uh, amount of debt involved on both sides, uh, which is extremely powerful. Um, in the US, the Affordable Care Act did trim uh, some of the more extraneous, horrible parts of uh, medical debt, but it's still it's still an issue. And this this depressed me. Um, I mean, I was hoping to find an analogy to something like, you know, um, Superman or something, but, uh, um, but that's- Or the Canadian healthcare system. <laughs> Oh, that would be great. We're working on it, man. We're working. Yeah. But, uh, but let I, me push, let me push and think about analogies on the biggest level. Is there something not useful to think about higher education as a consumer good? Is that an analogy that uh, is yeah. an analogy? Is it a reality? Is it something helpful to think with, uh, or does that fit into the category of the other analogies that you've just said didn't didn't seem terribly useful to think with? Um, I think it's fun to consider um, higher education as a consumer service. Um, the one problem is we often think about it as a consumer good, and it's important to make that distinction. Um, but also, if you think about it in terms of consumer economics, then that that leads to a whole series of, of lines of thought that may be productive. So you can think about, say, the, the criticism of the modern university being too corporate or too business oriented. You could follow that path. Or you could follow the path of students as consumers, and what does that mean? That's another path to go down. Or you can talk about, for example, uh, the financialization of American higher education, um, and and that's another path to follow. So I, I think I think the consumer part there is is, is quite useful. That, that that's all I have. I think you have enough sort of white guys with facial hair up here right now, so you can you can let me go back to my seat. Or back to your tanning room. Uh, <laughs> it's great to see you, Phil. Thank you. Uh, we have a few other people who actually have questions up here. Um, so let me just pop some of these questions on the screen so uh, um, we can uh, toss them around. Uh, from the awesome Thomas Tobin in, in uh, Wisconsin, or institutionally in Wisconsin, he asks, what is the most challenging area to explore as you are writing the book? Um, 
Yeah, we put that back up again, uh, just because uh, I expect that too quickly. Um, that's a that's a very kind question. Um, I, I think um, part of it was the sheer scope of technology um, that rapidly grew out of proportion, um, simply because technology uh, advances very very quickly. But there are also so many contours to it, so many outlines, and uh, I was having to devote more and more time to that. And I I think I ended up cutting off stuff that I. Would have liked to write more about, but that really began to bloom. So I had to do some, uh, if I go back to medical metaphor, I had to do some serious triage uh, in that area. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, we had a question from Steve Covello uh, in um, New Hampshire. Uh, let me just put this up. And let me just say again, it's great to have people from all over the place put this up maybe. Um, online enrollment in campus technology and campus culture. I don't know, Steve, because I haven't read the article. I will do it now, um, after this session, um, and try and find out more. That is from uh, the awesome Matt Reed, Dean Dad, uh, who's been a guest in the program and one of the best commentators in community colleges alive. Just a really great guy. Thank you for the pointer, Steve. Um, speaking of good friends, we have the. So, uh, maybe Brian isn't here anymore, or maybe it's just me. Oh, tag, I'm it. So, okay, so uh, while we're waiting for Brian. Did I just. Uh, uh, oh, there he is. Did I just blank out for a second? Yeah, you did. That's right. okay. I was all ready to take over for you. I can imagine you would. Uh, did you all see my question from Joellen? For about a second. Okay, let me bring this back up. Um, Joel and asked uh, to pay attention to uh, various sectors and subsectors, uh, which is a great question. Um, and since uh, and just for everybody's uh, knowledge, Joellen is a great friend. Uh, she led the National Institute for Technology and Liberal Education for years. I worked for her on that, which is a privilege and a great learning experience. Um, she's now with the Council of Independent Colleges, where she does great stuff there, um, and just uh, a wonderful person and an inspiration for me. Uh, this question is about subsectors and different, and this is a, Stephen, this is another reason why this is a book length project. Um, and you think about 4,400 institutions in the United States, and they're extraordinarily diverse in terms of everything, their public nature, their private nature, their scale, their mission. Some of them are secular, some of them are religious, and religious ones have just incredible numbers of sects. Uh, I mean, it's really extraordinary. Um, uh, almost unique part of uh, global higher education. And so I have to keep slicing and dicing this into different areas. Um, so one of the things I, I, one of the demarcations is geographical. Uh, we've talked about demographics in this program before. Uh, the demographic changes sweeping the world are very, very important. In the United States, they're very uneven. Uh, so the Northeast and the South, the Southeast, um, are suffering a serious decline in uh, producing children. They're aging rapidly. Um, whereas we have a sector stretching roughly from Texas to the Dakotas, which Nathan Graw, another previous guest in the program, has described as Fertility Alley. Yeah. Um, I was in uh, Idaho working with the university there, and uh, the, the locals said, we do something that the rest of the country has forgotten how to do. We make babies, and, and, and that's quite true. Um, but that, that demographic impetus, among other things, uh, has a huge, huge impact on a lot of colleges and universities um, in that it starts to draw down the number of 18-year-olds so colleges and universities that serve that population are going to be fighting each other more directly. Um, it also, the, the longevity aspect means we have to rethink adult education and possibly rethink how we approach uh, teaching and otherwise serving senior citizens. Um, now, th so this problem is not so great for those in the in fertility alley. That's one demarcation. Uh, a second is to break out private and public. Um, as the awesome Chris Newfield has established, the United States has systematically defunded public education for the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, and that's been a major, major factor in reshaping how public universities and colleges succeed. Um, my alma mater is uh, former president, uh, James Duderstadt said famously, he used to describe the University of Michigan as a state supported institution. Then he changed it to a state located institution. Now he calls it a state molested institution. Um, and, and this is, this is funny, but also telling, because it means that public universities have now really pushed hard on uh, 
um, privatization in all kinds of ways. It means the faculty and staff are encouraged to be more entrepreneurial. It means students go into more and more debt. It changes the politics of relations between universities and state governments. Um, and that's very, very different from public, I'm sorry, from private universities and colleges, which is about one third of higher education. We're in a different realm. So then a little further, as the debt crisis gets more and more daunting and frightening to more and more people, we see the rise of free public education. Uh, that happens to states like the Tennessee Promise or New York State with the Excelsior program, which then splits again that divide between, uh, deepens the divide between private and public universities and colleges. Um, it, so that those are other areas you can you can pull out. We can go still further. Uh, you think about Catholic universities, which are facing problems mostly due to the terrible ongoing specter of child sex abuse scandals. Uh, and so this is forcing a lot of Catholic universities to think about how they can attract students in an era where this is becoming more and more horrifying. Uh, think as well about, say, religious institutions on the Protestant side, uh, which are trying to market themselves to a demographic that is decreasingly affiliated with religions. Uh, you think about liberal arts colleges and universities, which is very dear to your heart, Joel, and mine. Um, and these have the advantage of, in many ways, giving us the best preparation for the 21st century, since they teach us to code switch across multiple domains, to think synthetically in, in, in a disciplinary way. Um, the downside is people often associate liberal arts with the humanities, and in the United States, the humanities enrollment is just collapsing across the nation. So that makes them a little less appealing. Um, I, I, I slice and dice this in many ways, and I could go on. But one, one more note. Um, Nationwide, like many countries, the United States is seeing a deepening divide between urban and rural populations. Um, and this is occurring on multiple levels, including infrastructure, age, economics, and politics. And so it may be that rural colleges and universities are having a harder and harder time attracting students, whereas urban or urban area uh, colleges and universities have a better time. Um, it may be that we're just going to start to empty out uh, the countryside. There's a great, great biologist, um, E.O. Wilson, who proposes that we should uh, uh, we should devote half of the land mass of human civilization completely to nature, um, and uh, obviously do it with the countryside. Um, I don't know if we're heading that way, um, but we're we're starting down that path, and that has a lot of implications for how you support uh, all these colleges and universities. Uh, friends, I, I've got Stephen on here, and I let him down gently uh, because he's been lovely to talk to. Um, let me do, thank you for coming, Stephen. Uh, I know we should have the reverse of a Star Trek, son. Uh, but what I'd like to do right now, uh, before we have even more questions, um, is uh, I would like to uh, uh, give away a couple of these books for free to everybody else who's uh, who is interested. So let me do this this way. I've got a list of everybody who has uh, checked in. Um, and what I'm going to do is um, pick people out by a random number. And if you are still here, I will give you um, a shout out. And you can just let me know um, your mailing address. And I can ship you the book right after our session is concluded. Uh, so let's see. We have two copies of the book. And the first one I have is to Clau Castellanis. Are you here? Well, I'm going to put you down, uh, Clau. And, um, and if I'm mispronouncing your name or misreading it from the uh, spreadsheet, please let me know. I don't see Clow, so let me get another number. How about now we're down to Eric Ruckman. Are you here, Eric? Let me see. I will try and bring in Eric and send him a copy after this. And I'd like to give away a T-shirt. So these are all extra large, white with the whole book cover, lovely design from Johns Hopkins University Press. And the first person that I can pick from that is number five, who is Stephen Ehrman. Are you there, Stephen? 
I hope so. I can send you a t-shirt right after this. And Stephen, you can let me know where I should send it to. I'm going to hold off on one more book and one more shirt as we continue. Um, but we have questions that are still coming up, and I want to bring these up here. Um, so we have a question from uh, Kelvin Bentley. Oh, great guy. Good to see you, man. Uh, Kelvin asks, what percentage of colleges and universities will suffer a clean sacrifice of some sort or for mergers and acquisitions? Uh, Kelvin, uh, so he's referring to a model I've been putting out called the Queen Sacrifice, which refers to when a college or university uh, gets rid of tenured and tenure track faculty. Uh, the metaphor is from chess. Um, I use it to describe uh, tenured faculty in the sense that they are the most powerful piece on the chessboard of academia in that they have governance roles, they have uh, often higher compensation, they have tenure. Um, and uh, usually they are the last to be axed in, um, in cuts, but they can be, either when an institution declares financial exigency or when an institution removes a program or, or decreases a major. Um, right now, I think the percentage of this has been pretty low, something like one or 2%, um, but I could see that rising to five or even 10%. Um, it's not widely reported. Um, sometimes colleges and universities try and do this without much publicity, which is kind of understandable. Um, but I would not be surprised to see 10% uh, doing uh, a queen sacrifice. In terms of closures and mergers, um, right now numbers are relatively low, but things are a bit edgy. Uh, I could see that going as high as 5%, especially in areas with very, very low demographics and low demand for higher education. Good question. Thank you. Um, and we have a, uh, another great question from Tom, uh, Tom Hames. And I want to bring Tom up on stage because I always do. Um, and because Tom is a good friend and someone I like to torment a lot. Tom, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. <clears throat> you're, you're, you're at the Institute right now, aren't you? Yes, I've been institutionalized. Well, I'm not going to touch that line with a 10-foot euphemism. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you asked you have a great question. Uh, what is the good that education is selling? What is the good that healthcare is selling? Um, it, it's, and the thing from your earlier discussion. No, oh, it's, it's a nice link. Um, it's a really, really good question. Uh, for me, higher education is, if you will, selling, um, and we do sell, because um, we do have market transactions, uh, a series of goods. Uh, the biggest two goods um, are clearly uh, learning, uh, in the form of teaching and learning in the form of research. Um, and those are kind of the two incontestable ones that uh, we're best known for. Now those are, as Joel pointed out, unevenly distributed because we have different sectors. So we don't expect a lot of research from say, for example, uh, community colleges. Uh, we don't expect a lot of research or any research from adjuncts, which are the majority, the preponderance of faculty in the United States. Um, but those two um, nevertheless as a whole are I think what we are vending. Um, there are also a few more things. Um, <clears throat> uh, but how do you measure that? I mean, the, the reason I ask the question is that, you know, what is the healthcare system selling? Is it health, you know, or is it treatment, right? And those are those are two distinct things because, yeah. you know, unless you have a, you know, most of the, most of the time the healthcare system is selling treatment. Um, occasionally, your doctor will give you some advice on on things you can do to remain healthy or to be healthier. But usually it's uh, it's after the fact and a, and a uh, palliative for, you know, what ails you. Yeah. I no. think there's a similar, there's a similar problem with, with education in that, um, you know, are we selling treatment or are we selling a uh, state of being? And it's a little different from healthcare in that sense, but equally hard to measure in my opinion. Um, the, the treatment is easier to measure because it's so self-contained um, that you know you can look at a clinic, you can look at a, a person at home taking medication or a person in a hospital, right. and you can isolate that. And they're designed to be isolated. Um, and and you can do the same thing with teaching um, and with research. Um, you know you can you have final exams, you have um, uh, professional exams, as well as being able to track research through a we're measuring there what not necessarily how educated they are but, but how well they take those exams well quite true quite true and you could say as well that uh, how well people respond to treatment directly to radiation for example right well not dying is a good marker 
Well, you'd think we do have a disturbing amount of deaths by accidents in in uh, um, in healthcare. Um, the problem is once we step out and say, okay, well, we we want to produce uh, knowledge uh, and learning, for example, in society, then you can you can try to measure the total amount of learning in a given nation. Um, but two big problems occur. One is that um, it's a nightmarish problem, and no one agrees on the different parts of it. I mean, for example, the uh, uh, I'm just blanking the name of it. There's a math and reading test, that uh, international test that just came out a couple of months ago. PISA. I'm sorry? PISA? Yes, the PISA one. Thank you. Um, and that still is controversial. I, I, I think it's the best one we've got, but it's still very hard to measure. Um, and the second problem it, with that is um, inputs are now huge. Um, so it's the same, again, with, with healthcare. You know, we can measure the, the health of a nation. It runs into these two problems as well. For weight, we use BMI, which is almost widely hated and derided and still used uh, throughout medicine. Um, and the number of inputs are just insane. You know, do you, mm -hmm. you know, is it, te does television watching alter either of these? What about uh, physical health? How does that impact uh, learning? There was a great story a couple of weeks ago about a school in Los Angeles where they kind of accidentally replaced an air filter and upped the test scores of students. <laughs> so how do you... There's also data that shows things like sunlight has a major impact on things like that, yeah. or the time of day you give the tests. Yeah. Um, uh, and so these are all things that that come into play there too. Now, yeah. I mean, the point I'm trying to make, you know, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that it's it's... It's hard, you know, we don't produce a car at the end of our process. You know, we can't point to the fact that we've built 50,000 Fords or something like that. Uh, we produce graduates, but whether or not those graduates are capable of doing anything is is yet to be determined, I think. Uh, no, th that's a good point. Uh, and this is one that's, that's very, very hard, hard to solve. Um, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, it's one way to think about. And this may be for either of us, um, another research project to explore when we're both, um, when you're finished with your current one and um, as I, my next one. This weekend. This weekend. Uh, <laughs> let me know. Let me know. Time. We have um, another question up here from Amanda Burbage. So let me bring Amanda up on stage. Hello, Amanda. Hey, Brian and everybody. I'm glad to be joining the conversation. I am really excited about the book. Can't yeah. wait to read it. Thank you. And um, I want to ask you a thousand questions, but the one I'm going to ask you while I'm on the podium is uh, how does your uh, how do your future scenarios relate to um, kind of the. Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, and you know how uh, I mentioned before how I had this uh, problem of uh, cutting back. Um, so you don't have to mute yourself. We, we can keep talking. Right? Um, you, you know how I mentioned uh, how I had to cut back on, on technology and how I couldn't talk about international higher education fully? Um, uh, this is part of the problem. It, 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 I love history, and I have a degree in history, and I wanted to see so much about history. But then Greg, my editor, would never have spoken to me again. It would have been an eight-volume work. Um, so I uh, partly I reach back into recent history to pull out a few things. So, for example, um, in our lifetime, I, I think the lifetime of everybody involved in this conversation, um, higher education has expanded uh, in every measure. You know, the number of institutions, the number of students, the number of people working in institutions. And that's a great thing. I mean, we have more people with more learning. Uh, Tom cautions us about measuring it, but we can at least see that experience. We can count that. Um, now, in, in so you can look back in the U.S. from about 1982 to about 2012, we had this long boom, this continuous growth, which is very exciting. Um, well, about 2012, it stopped growing and has actually gone down a bit ever since. Um, and that's a real caution. So I, I would think back, how have we dealt with this in the past? Um, you know, how, what kind of crises have we gone through? And it turns out in the late 70s and early 80s, we, among other things, you know, tried to reinvent parts of higher ed to try to be more sustainable. Um, I, I, I go back to the past for all kinds of things. There's a great book about uh, the populist movement in the 1890s 
So, you know, we say we have a populist moment now, but you actually have a capital P populist party um, and that seized control democratically of, of state governments, which then were able to control public universities. It's fascinating to see how, how they changed their curriculum. And we see echoes of that now. Um, I, I also looked at the past for inspiration. Um, the land grant universities were invented um, by a law passed um, and led by a, a Vermont senator, Justin Morrill, during the American Civil War. And that, that just flabbergasts me every time I think of it. You know, you're fighting this epic, brutal, horrific, nearly total war. In the meantime of that, you say, well, let's reinvent higher education. My God, what what vision? You know, to be able to, be able to do that, I, I think that's just that, that. So I yes, I, I keep thinking of the past. And and when you mentioned the sins of the fathers, one more aspect of that, and one thing that I've been tracking is is the persistent and horrendous problem of racial inequality in higher education. And now we're seeing that take a more historical turn where we have colleges and universities like like Georgetown, where I work, um, that are trying to settle with the past. Uh, by doing forms of reparations, for example, or scholarships. Um, so I, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, thank you so much, Miranda. We have um, uh, a few more questions popping up, and uh, let me just grab these here. Uh, so there's one from uh, ah, Joshua Kim, um, which is always good to hear from him. Um, he has a new book that he's co-authored that's coming out too. I'm looking forward to having him on the program. Would you recommend that your kids pursue a career in higher education? If so, which one? It's a good question and a personal one. Um, I could get very personal about my children and, and their interests and their work. And I, I, I kind of want to hold back from that in respect of their privacy. Um, so I'll be a little abstract. Uh, partly it depends on their interest and what they're working on and what their aptitude is. Um, so it may be that for one of my children, um, it may be that working in a higher education institution actually is a good fit for him in certain ways. Um, again, I, I hate to be cryptic, but I'm, I'm trying to respect his privacy. Um, and maybe for him, the museum world is actually a good fit. Um, but not for my, uh, not for my daughter. Um, uh, her temperament and her interest really lead in different places. Um, I would really hesitate before recommending anybody become a faculty member at this stage. Um, one of the trends that I tracked, and the uh, the dedication of my book is about this, um, is that in the United States we have uh, turned our, our labor force into uh, temps. Uh, the majority of faculty are part-time adjuncts. So the dedication of my book is to adjuncts. Um, I say to all adjunct faculty who do more than anyone with less than anyone to build the future of higher education. And uh, for people who can do the adjunct life, people who are independently wealthy or who uh, don't need to do so for economic reasons because they have another career, um, bravo to them. Uh, and to all the adjuncts, I, I'm, this is an, a heroic and criminally mistreated group of people. Um, and, but I, I would hesitate before sending anyone down that path. It's a good question. Um, and uh, we have another question from the awesome Roxanne. So let me put this up here. Roxanne Riskin asked if I could talk about climate challenges and technological trends, including VR conferences. Um, so um, before I, oh gosh, there's so much to say about that. Uh, climate change is uh, my next topic, one that I'm working very hard on. Um, and that's going to possibly be a book um, in the near future. Uh, because climate change hits us in a few different angles. There's the physical plant angle, that is how many campuses worldwide are faced with either rising water or desertification. Uh, how many campuses also have to reconfigure their physical plant in order to become more carbon neutral, either because they want to or because of political pressure, either internally or externally. How will curriculum change um, as we try to uh, make our, our campuses approach the climate emergency. So what fields will expand and which will contract? How will pedagogy change? Um, how will we change uh, the physical way we do business in terms of travel? Will we have fewer academic conferences? Will study abroad decrease? Uh, these are some of the questions we have to deal with right now. Um, speaking of which, um, uh, involved in the uh, conversation right now is the awesome Trent Batson, 
who has just published an ebook on this very topic called The Last Humans. And Trent, if you want to put your uh, uh, the URL to that um, in the chat box, that would be great to see. And Roxanne and Trent, you guys should definitely know each other. You're almost neighbors, I think. Um, that's a really great question. Now, in order to uh, um, fulfill my promise to give away things, I'm going to give away two more items, one more T-shirt. I will do this to another person picked at random from our list of guests. So that will go to what looks like Henrietta Paz Amor. Henrietta, are you here? Let me go over to our list of folks and see if I can bring her in. I don't see her on this right now. I'm going to have to follow up with her right afterwards. And then one more buck. Let's see, who gets to have the last book for this? We have one more random number generator. Thank you, Google. The book goes to Stephen Crawford. Good for you, man. I'm going to email all of you guys, make sure I get your physical address, and ship these out. Oh, by the way, I promised... Uh, I promised uh, silly hats, and I didn't get to put mine on yet, so let me just do that. And Vanessa, let me see if I can get you on, Vanessa. Vanessa, how's your broadband? Can you hear and see us? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm anchored on a, the hot, on a hot spot. I anchored my phone as a hot spot, and that seems to be working better. Excellent. Good to see you. Well, I, I just wanted, because of the occasion, I wanted to come up and say congratulations in person, and I've already ordered my book, you know, so I don't have to feel bad about not getting a free one. There's a 40% off sale at John Hopkins. Grab it. Grab it now. Yes. I, I To be honest, I don't know if I would have bought it if it wasn't on sale, because I was going like, oh, no, I don't know about that. But I ordered it. And um, I, 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 I want to tell you just how much I, I appreciate your, your uh, dedication. Thank you. As a, as, a, as, a retired, as a retired adjunct in bad health. I appreciate that. I, I, and I really admire how you've been with us since the beginning. Um, you well, do, you, do you remember our first encounter? No, you don't. I, you were a guest person at somebody's uh, CMOOC, one of those, back when everybody was doing their own CMOOC. Yes. And you came on as a sort of like, we're going to talk to this consultant, Brian Alexander. And I was there and I asked you a question about adjunct labor and the MOOC. And the, and the, the guy running the MOOC said, oh no, we, we don't want to talk about that right now. And you answered the question. And I thought, following this guy, <laughs> Thank you for remembering that, Vanessa. Thank you so much. That's a, as you know, that's a cause dear to my heart. And you are dear to our hearts as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, my friend. Well. Friends, we're at the last minute of uh, the last of, of this session. And so I just want to give a couple of people a, one more chance. Uh, Ophelia Mangan asked a question. Um, she asks about what chapter of a book should I use with instructors who prohibit the use of any tech or devices in their classrooms? Ophelia, I may have just the right one for you, although I'm not sure if it'll work or it'll backfire. Uh, chapter 13 is called Retro Campus, and the idea of that is campuses that deliberately try not to have any technology. Uh, it's a kind of satire. Um, see if they recognize themselves in it. Um, now, the other thing you could do <clears throat> is extreme opposite <clears throat> and show them the uh, one augmented campus, which has the greatest amount of technology, or show them the scenario called Renaissance, uh, where I celebrate the creativity uh, that humans can do, that humans can show as we use digital technology. So either of those, I think, would be, uh, would be very good. Thank you for the great question. Uh, friends, I take my hat off to you all, uh, literally and figuratively. Um, you're in the acknowledgments to this book um, because I have learned so much from you in the past four years, uh, from your thoughts, your questions, your feedback, and I've also learned from your spirit. Um, you've been generous with your time, some of you with your money, all of you uh, with your sense of humor, 
And I really, really appreciate that. Um, I thank you now from the bottom of my heart, and I thank you as well from the front of the book. Um, thanks again. Uh, speaking of books, uh, Tom Tobin uh, has a new book coming out. Tom, if you could put a link to it in the chat book, in the chat box so everyone could see it, that would be great. And before we go, let me tell you about the next couple of weeks. Uh, our guest next week, um, January 23rd, there's two guests, Callie Renison and Amy Bonomi. They are the authors and editors of a new book on women leading change in academia, which is a really exciting book, uh, very, very important for our time. There's the link to it. <clears throat> if you'd like to join us, we'd be glad to see you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we're also um, continuing to put up more and more videos. So if you'd like to go look at previous uh, programs, the whole archive is there on tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about this, we're all over social media from Twitter to Slack to LinkedIn and Facebook. We'd be glad to hear from you all. Again, thank you so much. I'm just in debt to you all, and I'm delighted uh, to have been able to spend time with you. Thank you so much. Read Academia next. Tell your friends. See you next time. Bye-bye.